Hello, my well-being buddies. So, welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to look at gender dysphoria, and through this session, we're going to look at what gender dysphoria is, what causes it, some of those risks. Look at some of the signs, understand um, how this is assessed. Look at some of the natural treatments out there, and then look at what the medication interventions are. So let's just start off by talking about this. This is a hot topic at the moment. Um, however, at the end of the day, that's not what we're going to be discussing here. We're going to be discussing what the diagnosis is and how we get there. So gender dysphoria is a term that describes a sense of being unease in the person. And it's a mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. And I think this is where it falls down in a lot of arguments. People are saying, but you're biologically this, and nobody's disagreeing that. Uh, you are born in a biological way. However, their gender identity is something very different. And for most of us, our biological sex and our gender identity are one of the same. But for others, there is this sense of unease, this sense of not belonging, this sense of being trapped in the wrong body and not feeling that you're living their true self. So this is a sense of unease um, and it's an intense sense and it can lead to depression, anxiety. It has a real harmful impact on their day-to-day -day life. It equally causes self-harm, suicidal ideation and just a whole sense of being not fitting in. So it is a real mental health condition that needs the same level of empathy and sympathy as any other mental health condition. So what is gender identity? Well, gender identity refers to our sense of who we are and how we describe ourselves. For example, we can identify as male, female, or sometimes we could be called uh, the binary identities. And again, we're not going to go into the political aspect of that. But for some people, they feel their gender identity is different from their biological sex. So it's as simple as that. So, for example, my biological sex is male, but I may feel inside that my gender identity doesn't align. So for some people, um, this may be due to they have genitals, facial hair, but their identity doesn't feel masculine it feels much more feminine and vice versa for females their genitalia may be uh, obviously the vagina and the breast but their identity just doesn't feel female and some people don't define themselves as either so it's that binary identity um not really fitting into either terms and this is used in a different term such as gender diverse or gender non-conforming again all to do with uh, how one sees oneself as a gender identity. So gender dysphoria and gender identity then um, look at um, the desire to have a match or to have their identity and their belonging to become one. Um, so for some people, the gender dysphoria will not always want them to change. Uh, they're quite happy to be that. And for others, they, they may want um, hormones or surgery to express their gender identity. So gender dysphoria in itself is not a mental illness, but some people may develop mental health problems because of the gender dysphoria. And that's because of the anxiety, the mental health piece around depression, mood and self-harm. People with gender dysphoria uh, may change their appearance, they may change their behaviour and or their interests. And equally, there are common signs for discomfort and distress. So this could be low self-esteem, becoming withdrawn from the uh, social circles, depression sneaking in, high levels of anxiety. Again, it may be about taking uh, unnecessary risks uh, and there can be signs of self-neglect. So children and gender identity, children may show an interest in clothes and toys that society tells us that they should have, uh, which is to the opposite of the genders. Uh, and this may uh, be unhappy with, also they may be unhappy with their physical sex characteristics. 
However, this type of behaviour is reasonably common in childhood and it is part of growing up. It does not mean that all children behaving this way have gender dysphoria and or a gender identity issue. Um, and I very much remember playing with my sister's Barbies and cars. I just enjoyed playing with her Barbies and cars. It did not mean that I wanted to identify as female. A small number of children may feel uh, a lasting or severe distress, which gets worse as they get older. And again, this normally kicks in around that puberty age. And that's when they start to really express their body and their feeling. And they get a sense of this gender identity versus their binary, their, their uh, biological. So equally, at this point, we can start looking at discussing things around identity and what gender identity means. So this can be quite a tricky subject, um, but how do you get help? What is it that you can do? So you can go to your GP and you can talk to them about you or your child having gender dysphoria. So that sense of not being one's true self. If the GP agrees with you, they can refer you to clinics uh, where you'll be assessed by a specialist team. You will not be assessed by mental health services at first as the GP does not need prior approval um, from integrated care boards to do this referral. You can self-refer to gender dysphoria clinics, um, but a referral from the GP is best because it shows that they're part of that shared care agreement, they're part of that multidisciplinary team. And they've obviously got a lot more details on your medical history. So again, things around um, your mental health and well-being or neurodivergence, etc. So you'll be seen by a doctor or psychologist uh, and they'll obviously um, carry out their referral. Children under the age of 18 um, will obviously be referred to the Gender Identity Development Services and that's where they get to explore identity, etc. Now, obviously, for these services, there is a huge increase in numbers, a huge increase in awareness. So therefore, there are going to be long waiting times for some of these services to come around. But the treatment for gender dysphoria, again, we're looking at after a detailed assessment to confirm the diagnosis of your gender dysphoria and what it means to you will mean that you get a treatment plan. And this treatment plan uh, is co-produced with you and with the GP. So again, uh, any recommendations for medication is then shared and you've got a treatment pathway, which is obviously the safest way of going. So what causes gender dysphoria? Well, the exact cause is actually unclear. It could be through gender development. It's quite complex uh, and there are still things that we don't fully understand. Gender dysphoria is not related to sexual orientation. So it's got nothing to do with sexual orientation. So people with gender dysphoria may still identify as straight, gay, lesbian or bisexual. So again, we need to move that concept to one side. How common is gender dysphoria? Well, no one really knows this either, but there is a sense of unease around identity um, and around the gender diverse needs. Uh, the late, the earliest data that we have, which was back in 2019, just before the pandemic, was around 8,000 people were being referred to the services in England. So a reasonable amount of people being referred. So if we then look at the signs, um, so the signs in children, it's a rare condition in children. Most children who seem confused about the gender identity when they're young will continue to feel the same beyond puberty. Um, however, talk to your GP about this if you're worried about your child showing signs of being depressed, anxious or withdrawn. But in teenagers, we're looking at then how they're developing. Uh, and this could be a feeling of gender dysphoria, being in childhood and now being in a much clearer sense of their gender identity and how to deal with that. So again, looking at that piece around their biological sex. They may identify in a different sexual orientation, so gay, lesbian, bisexual. When, when their gender dysphoria um, kind of comes out in the teenage to adult years, it can be seen in different ways. So again, it feels like this conflict between gender identity and biological sex. 
They feel comfortable only when they're in the gender role that they prefer to be. This may include being non-binary. So again, it's the sense of ease. So it may just be that the, their identity, so the way that they look, the way that they dress, is what calms it all down and gives them a sense of belonging. And again, this could be non-binary. So being in a neutral position in, in what we're wearing. They have a strong desire to hide their physical signs of their biological sense. So this strong desire may be to get rid of the biological signs. So that could be binding, so of the chest, that could be tucking of the genitals. It could be to do with the, the, the hair, so I have long or short. And again, just looking at the way that their sense of dressing. And again, there may become a strong dislike to their genitals or their biological sense. So the sense of unease and not liking the parts they have. Again, I know a lot of trans people um, and in the trans community that have kept parts of their bi biology um, because it is an identity thing rather than a biological thing. So again, just working with that. Uh, you may feel lonely, they may feel isolated, or they may feel under pressure from work to conform to act in certain ways. And again, may face bullying, harassment. Uh, and I know a lot of trans people, and I've worked with a lot of trans people, and I have friends that are trans, and I hear their stories. I hear their stories of their pain. I hear their stories of discomfort. I hear their stories of discrimination. And I hear their stories of inequality. And the reality is they're not trying to change the world. They're just looking for equal rights. And that in itself is a fair comment. We have all in our lives strived for equality. Women have strived for equality. Minority ethnic groups have strived for equality. People with disabilities have, have strived for equality and rights. And the trans community are doing exactly the same. They're trying to strive for the same equalities that they should be having. And it almost seems in 2023 that I can't believe we're even having that discussion around equality, but here we are. They may feel depressed. So again, managing not necessarily the gender dysphoria, but some of the symptoms may be the best way that we can help people with gender dysphoria. So if they are feeling depressed, that could be an onward piece of referral to maybe the NHS, uh, 111 services, or those free listening services. So children under the age of 18 uh, would normally be referred to the CAM services for psychological support. So that's the Children, Young People's Mental Health Services. Uh, and again, sadly, there is much huge waiting list for CAM services. Uh, but for adults, as we've already said, they can have that uh, first appointment with the gender dysphoria clinic uh, and then look at treatment. And there are several things that can be done. Equally, if they're struggling about their mental health, so this is the side piece, it may be things to do with healthier lifestyles. So we can do smoking sensation advice to give up on smoking, for example. There may be weight loss things there that need to be done. It may be about medication, but what we don't want people to do is be going online and buying self-medication for hormones. Again, information advice and guidance around contraception and safe sex and social transitioning. So living in your preferred gender and that piece on social transitioning. So changing your name, changing your identity and managing that. And a part of social transitioning for most gen, uh, transgender people is this name change. Uh, and again, finding a name that matches who you feel inside. And again, that could be done via depot services and you don't need to pay for those. They're normally free. You can find those online. And once you've got your documents, you can start to change your identity with your bank accounts, um, passports, driving licenses, et cetera, and your GP. Uh, and your GP will use the preferred pronouns to how you should be identifying. So treatment then, um, under the 18, we're looking at, uh, there are two clinics for children under the age of 18, uh, and that's looking at clinical psychologists, uh, child psychologists, child and adolescent psychiatrists, family therapists, and social work. And they're normally done through the Gender Identity Development Services. 
And that can involve things such as family therapy, individual child therapy, counselling, and really getting that wraparound service done right. Uh, and there may be a referral for specialist hormones um, or block or hormones that block certain things around puberty. Puberty blockers, um, again, they are there. They they can be prescribed. It's not something that, that we would do. Uh, it is definitely a specialist service. So again, um, therefore, the age of 16, teenagers who have been on hormone blockers for at least the last 12 months. Um, so again, they're looking at gender reforming hormones. So transition to adult gender identity services, um, 17 years and older, are able to go to the adult gender identity services and these clinics are designed to obviously um, look and provide support around gender identity and non-binary issues uh, and treatment for adults then there again psychology support such as counselling, cross-sex hormone therapy, speech and language therapy for voice therapy so your voice sounds more like the match of your identity. And then hormone therapy for adults, then the aim of hormone therapy is to make it more comfortable to live with yourself uh, in terms of your physical appearance and how you feel. It's important to remember that hormone therapy is only one of the treatments for gender dysphoria. It's not going to be the be all and end all. There are risks of taking hormone therapy and those risks can involve blood clot, gallstones, weight gain, acne, um, elevated liver enzymes and hair loss or um, boarding so again just be mindful of that surgery for adults so again some people may decide to have surgery uh, to permanently alter their body and this will be done based on the recommendations of your doctor so at the gender dysphoria clinic you'll be referred to a surgeon outside the clinic who are experts in that type of work and again um, in addition to having social transitioning to your identity in the last year before a referral was made, it's also advised to look at that at smoking, look at your weight loss. So trying to get uh, your BMI under 25 and then have started to seek some kind of cross sex hormones for surgical procedures. Surgery for trans men can look at common chest uh, things. So, again, this could be removal of both breasts uh, nipple repositioning um, and uh, implants and, and tattooing and surgery for trans men can also include uh, the penis and the scrotums and, and a penis implant and then surgery for trans women can obviously be the removal of testicles removal of penis construction of a vagina um, and again breasts so again lots of different things there to have a think about once that's been done, you need to think about your life after transitioning. So how you can be supported, what support's going to be there and your health needs. So again, thinking about your biological birth sex and making sure that your biological birth sex is still being recognized. So for example, if you are now female to female, you still have a prostate and making sure that the prostate is checked. And again, if you are female to male making sure that any necessary uh, checks are being done for um again female hormones etc that that uh, would need to be checked so looking at that life beyond there um you will have the body that looks like the one that you want you have that identity that feels real to you um, and you get to obviously now live your life uh, feeling that you are the person that you are meant to be. But it doesn't end there. There will still be your mental health things to look after. So you'll still need to think about the impact on this, the trauma based on this and that ongoing piece of therapy. Trans people are at much higher risk of self-harm and at risk of suicide because of the stigma and because of how difficult it is to, to go through that process. So again, lots of things that need to be thought about. Um, equally, trans female people with breast tissue um, will obviously need to have routine breast screening uh, from 50 to 71. Um, and again, there's some tips on the NHS website about managing trans and non-binary stuff. 
So the NHS have produced lots of guidelines for gender dysphoria. It's worth reading them. It covers things like um, the interventions, the surgical interventions, and how they support children and young people. So hopefully we've covered now what gender dysphoria is and some of the causes. We've looked at some of the risks uh, and we've, we've understood what some of those risks are around medication. We've talked about some of the signs. So looking at people feeling uncomfortable, dressing in the clothes that make them feel more comfortable, um, maybe hiding or binding body parts. Um, how it's assessed then, so it's done through so, uh, psychological screening um, and uh, psychiatry through a gender dysphoria clinic. Natural treatments for gender dysphoria, again, it's all going to be around cognitive behaviour support. It's all going to be about living well. It's all going to be about that smoking sensation, the alcohol reduction, um, and to manage your mental health and well-being. And again, medical treatments, we've talked about those hormone replacements and the, the, the sex hormones there to help manage that. So I'm hoping that this little overview of gender dysphoria has given you a much better insight into the world of gender dysphoria. And my name's Steve and I'm the mental health nurse. Take care for now.